Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian. I'm up here at James D. Julia's auction house in rural Maine. I'm taking a look at some of the cool guns that they're selling in their October 2015 auction. And one of the cool things actually about this, this upcoming auction is that they've added an entire day of guns that are frankly a little less expensive than what Julia normally deals with. So they've added um, a, a whole day, a specific auction lot or section of guns that are in the two to eight thousand dollar range. Now that may not sound like not that much money, but you know what, that's getting into the actual affordable realm for some of us who aren't independently wealthy. Now this gun is actually out of that specific lot, which kind of surprised me actually considering how cool and how absolutely gorgeous this example is. This is a Holek Automat and it came out of Czechoslovakia and if there was one gun building family of Czechoslovakia. It would be the Holek family. There were three brothers who between them developed an awful lot of the cool guns that we're familiar with from Czechoslovakia. They were Vaklov, Frontacek, and Emanuel. And so Vaklov and Frontacek did uh, most of what we're familiar with. They're the ones who gave us the Bren gun, the Bisa, uh, which the British Army also used, the ZB-26, that family of guns. Well, Emanuel, the third brother, wasn't, you know, he was a talented gun designer of his own right. He was responsible for the ZH-29, which is really a fascinating early semi-automatic rifle. He also developed the ZH-39, which we know very little about or have very few of in this country. And so he actually left the Brno factory, left their employment in 1938 to start up his own shop. And what he did on his own was build mostly sporting rifles, actually. Um, custom, very nice sporting rifles. And as part of that, he had his own semi-automatic sporting rifle design that he called the, the, the Holek Automat, or automatic. We have an example of it here. This particular one is in seven millimeter Mauser. They were mostly made in seven and eight millimeter Mauser. These were actually made during World War II from like 1938 until about 1944. Um, the Germans, Surprisingly, when the Germans occupied Czechoslovakia, they actually let him keep his shop open and keep building sporter guns. Apparently, he must not have had the capacity to make military guns or they didn't think they needed it at the time. And, and surprisingly, he actually continued to do that all the way through the war. Now, these were never a hugely popular gun. Uh, they didn't make all that many of them, probably less than a thousand. This particular one is serial number 280 uh, something. But it's a really cool gun, and when we take a look at the inside, you'll see all sorts of, of elements of the Bren gun in there. Because, hey, you know, his brother invented the Bren gun, so take the good ideas where you can get them. Uh, interesting features to this gun. Uh, first off, we have a detachable magazine. It's a single stack mag. Comes out. Only holds a couple of rounds. Again, this is a sporting rifle. Most curiously, it actually cocks using the front sling swivel. We'll take a closer look at that in a moment. But uh, that means you'd, you're not going to be shooting this slung up um, you know, in a fixed shooting sling because that's not going to work. So in the briefest of details, what we have here is a semi-automatic, gas-operated, uh, long-stroke, gas-piston, tilting bolt, semi-automatic rifle. And with that in mind, why don't we go ahead and take it apart and see what it looks like on the inside. Let's start with the markings right there. We have original Holek Automat and his circular logo thingy. We have some proof marking here on the side. And on the opposite side, we have the 7x57 caliber mark, along with the serial number 286. So external controls, magazine release, very simple. Pull it back, pull the magazine out. This looks like it probably holds two or three cartridges, maybe two plus one, maybe three plus one when you've got one in the chamber. Um, it's a sporting rifle, you don't need a big magazine, and you don't want it to fall out if you bump that catch. Charging handle is actually up here, attached to the front sling swivel. So push this back, that charges the bolt. Here you can see it in from the top, just like so. It does not lock open when it's empty and it ejects out the top. Here's our rear sight, just a, a plain U-notch to go with our rather basic front sight blade. Now, disassembly. We are going to take this pin, has a little spring-loaded section here. I'm gonna push that in. There we go. 
this pin comes out, and then the top and bottom of the rifle just slide apart. There we go, there's our upper and lower assemblies separated. I can just barely get them both in the, the frame at the same time. Take a look at the lower real quick. Hammer fired. This firing mechanism looks very much like a ZH-29, which makes sense when you figure that the guy who invented it also invented the ZH-29. So there's our hammer. Pull the trigger, hammer comes up. Safety, I should have mentioned earlier, is right here on the back. This side is, sa is fire. Flip it over there, and you're on safe. All right, the way this safety works is very simple. This piece rotates when I rotate the safety, and you can see it's got a cutout on this side, none on that side, and when I pull the trigger, it lifts that bar up. So if that's in the way, trigger can't move. Gun is safe. Moving on to the upper assembly. In order to take out the bolt, we have to do the very laborious procedure of slide it out the back of the gun. So there's that. The bolt then slides out of the bolt carrier. We can even take our gas tube here, rotate it 180 degrees, and it slides out. So our gas tube is out. We now have a barreled receiver. There is a gas port up inside here, which I don't think I have good lighting to show you. The barrel is pinned into the receiver right here, and then ground very, very smooth. And not that much going on in the back. I mentioned that the, the bolt locks into the top of the receiver. Well, we've got a screw head here, and then this is our locking block. Again, very much, pretty much exactly like a Bren gun. If the gun uh, loses headspace for some reason, you can take this locking uh, shoulder out and replace it with a new one, grind it to exact size, and have the headspace correct again. So when the carrier is moving, so that's, that's the locked position. When the carrier moves back, these two hooks grab the lug on the bolt, pull it down, and then it can cycle backwards. When it comes forward, this gets pushed all the way forward. The bolt face hits the chamber and stops. And then this ramp pushes the lug of the bolt up, at which point this very shiny surface right here locks into the locking shoulder and the gun is ready to fire. At that point, the firing pin uh, is accessible there. So when the gun's not locked, the firing pin is actually shielded down here and cannot be struck by the hammer. That's a safety mechanism that prevents it from firing out a battery. On the bolt head itself, we have an extractor, again, very, very reminiscent of a Bren gun, or a ZB-26, same thing, basically. Plunger ejector at the bottom, firing pin in the middle. This ejects out the top. Now, our bolt carrier assembly gets even easier to, well, continues to be just as easy to disassemble. I'm going to take the spring and pull it out of its stop. So there's our recoil spring, recoil spring guide, and then the gas piston simply lifts off of the carrier. That groove sits right there, easy to take off. This is the actual body of the piston itself. The spring runs inside it, and then this runs inside the gas tube, just like that. That hole connects to our gas port into the barrel, and you can see here at the front, that's the, the chamber. Gas comes in, pushes this whole thing back against the spring and cycles the gun. You'll notice, of course, that the sling swivel is permanently attached to the gas piston, so you certainly cannot sling up like, say, the American Marine Corps would tell you to do to get a, a precise shot because that's going to put pressure on this and pull the gun out of battery. Uh, you also don't want to have your hand on this because this is reciprocating. This will come back every time you fire. Bolt carrier, a little complex to manufacture, but uh, pretty simple in function. Not a whole lot to it. We've got a couple little rails up here to properly locate the bolt during its travel, and that's about it. All in all, an extremely easy gun to field strip.
Well, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. These are really cool guns. They're really quite rare. Um, never really took off. Not surprising that not a whole lot of people were able to spare the money to buy a nice custom semi-auto hunting rifle in the middle of World War II in Europe. Might have had something to do with it. At any rate, if you would like this one, check the link in the description text below, and that'll take you to Julia's catalog page on it. There is actually a second one of these also in the auction. Um, this one is, like I said, in that first day of kind of the, the more affordable guns. Uh, the other one, I believe, is in the main section of the auction, but I will leave it to you guys to peruse through the catalog and find the other one. Hope you enjoy the video. Thanks for watching.